Hi, um, yeah, I'm Gemma. I uh, farm in Dorset. Uh, I grew up farming. We'll go through a slide. Um, uh, where's it not working? There we go. Um, but dairy, like my dad was a dairy farmer, my grandfather was a dairy farmer here on the farm that I'm on now. Uh, and I loved the calves. I like the cows, not dairy. Like, that's just not my thing. Uh, I did have a cow. Like I, I decided that every red cow on the farm would be mine. She wasn't really red, but she had a red dorsal stripe. That was enough. Um, but sheep were my passion from like tiny. Uh, we tenanted a separate farm, my dad did, uh, that had sheep on it. And I would go there every opportunity and rear pet lambs. Um, those are my two foundation ewes. From when I was seven, I realized that the pet lambs did not go back to the farm. Uh, so from then on, I kept ewe lambs um, as bottle lambs and then lambed them. Uh, but dad always capped me about 40 ewes, uh, thinking I would grow out of it, even though my 14th birthday, I wanted texels. I had got some pedigree texels, some cast ewes, uh, but soon, I mean, even then at that age, I realized I preferred performance over, over aesthetics and they didn't last very long because they were a lot of hard work. Um, so yeah, so, but my dad really encouraged me to uh, pursue other avenues. Um, he thought that farming was too hard. Uh, it got to a point where we'd sold one dairy to make way for a golf course. The other dairy went in 2000. Um, and he just told me to go and get a job that would pay for the farming. Um, so I did a photography degree. I loved it. Um, but my two sheep ended up this. So I did a photography degree, um, a chance meeting in a club in Birmingham. I was at uh, Nottingham Trent, but I went to Birmingham for a night and I met some people at MTV. And literally I was driving, driving back to Nottingham. I said to my friend, I'm gonna work for MTV. And she laughed at me, um, but I kicked down some doors. I got a work experience. I did, I just made use of the contacts and ended up working for MTV. Um, that led to a freelance uh, career in TV. I um, ended up as a producer director, just as I had kind of made it. I was cycling to work, I cycled everywhere in London. I uh, hated getting the tube, so I cycled everywhere. And I was cycling to work one morning, um, the day before going off on a big shoot. And uh, lorry, I was in a cycle lane, the lorry turned left, kind of somehow took me under the front wheel and then drove for 30 yards with me under the front wheel on my front. Uh, from years of riding horses, I covered my face, which was the only part of me that, the front of me that wasn't one big road rash. Uh, my leg was a big old mess. Um, those staples are, were holding on my latissimus dorsi, which is the muscle that runs here, um, to rebuild my leg. Um, so yeah, that was like the beginning of a massive change in my life. As I was like about to hit the lorry, it was one of those, it was slow-mo, so many thoughts went through my head. Uh, but the biggest one was, I'm not ready to die yet. Like I've got too much to do. Um, and when I, I was awake for the whole thing and I was awake until they got me to hospital. And then I had 12 hours of surgery on the first day and I woke up, um, saw my dad at the end of my bed and my dad was like the most laid back casual person ever and he looked like hell he looked 10 years older he looked so stressed i was bandaged from literally tips of my fingers uh, to my toes with a big metal cage around my leg um and seeing my dad i was like shit this is really bad uh, but the first thing i said was I'm moving home, I'm getting collie and I'm farming full time. I still had my sheep at the time, like my 40 years, but I was freelance. So I was I never took a job over lambing and I was up and <coughs> weekends. Um, 
but yeah so I that was my decision made and my dad at that point would have said yes to anything he was just happy I was alive wait um so yeah uh that the first week I was in and out of surgery every other day uh, but I made I was on a lot of drugs but I made a like conscious decision to sorry let me put the dog away Siggy Siggy come here um I made a conscious decision that I was going to focus on how lucky I was to be alive not how unlucky I was for, for a week they talked about amputating my leg so it was pretty tough but I made a conscious decision that I was lucky that they were going to save my leg I was lucky to be alive not that I was unlucky that I was there at that point in time and I tried not to allow myself to think of the what ifs and if only's because it, it doesn't change anything um like it it doesn't make any difference so you can go over and over and over it and think if I'd left the house five minutes earlier it wouldn't have happened but it had happened so I just focused on my recovery um the uh like I, I got them to as soon as I was I mean I had to lie flat for three weeks um I wasn't allowed to move my leg at all I had holes in my stomach that you put your fists in and then they had to skin graft those so I spent a lot of time just literally lying there I couldn't even clean my own teeth I had a lot of time to think uh, so it wasn't always positive. Like I had times at three o'clock in the morning where I just really, really struggled. Um, and like every part of me ended up with scars. So it was a, it, it wasn't a short recovery mentally or physically. I lost like two stone in three weeks just from the trauma. And I wasn't a lot of, me. um, so yeah, it was, I'm not pretending that it was all great and I was like positive all the way through, but I was quite, tried to be quite strict with myself to not allow the negativity to take over. And like, I, I worked really hard immediately as soon as I could, I was like strengthening my arms because I knew I'd be on crutches for quite a long time. And I just focused on recovery. Um, I was really lucky that I had a really supportive partner at the time. My parents were amazing. Um, and like there was constant progress and then I got home they told me I'd be the in for at least three months and I got them to discharge me after five weeks I needed to see green I was like stuck in a box in East London um and I just did everything I could to get out because I knew that I needed like just to see countryside for my, my like sanity um and then I was fortunate to be able to move back to my mum's uh, and she was great uh, and looked after me really well. But again, I got home and the first thing I did was start looking for a collie pup. Um, like I just focused on things to keep me occupied and I found one through a few people quite quickly. And I got her, so my accident happened in September and I picked her up in December, just when I was starting on crutches. So as she, it was perfect because like as she needed more exercise I had to like work to get stronger and more fit, like be able to move around more um so she was actually amazing therapy for me uh, and gave me like it just stopped me lying in bed all day feeling sorry for myself I had to get up I had to to go and look after her um so yeah and then as soon as I could I moved back to the farm with my dad, my parents separated, were divorced. Um, and it, I, yeah, I was like, had a plastic bag wrapped around my foot because I was, I had a um, bandage on it for months and months. And we were on the quad telling dad what to do, <laughs> probably being really annoying, but having to get involved. Um, and yeah, so, but then I plateaued. Um, like my recovery plateau, hang on, sorry, Ziggy, out, out. Um, my recovery really plateaued and that mentally was really hard for me. And I was at a point where the doctors were telling me that was my 
that was the best it was going to be. Like I was permanently in quite a lot of pain in my ankle. Um, and I had a limp and I couldn't run. I was very weak and I was like just quite scared of my leg. I was really scared of injuring it. I didn't trust it at all. It was really unstable. Um, and my skin grafts, so I had quite a few skin grafts. And yeah, that was uh, a struggle. But from the very start, I did uh, I did seek therapy. I had uh, slight PTSD as well. Um, I'd have quite bad flashbacks and nightmares. I was not a good passenger in a car. I wouldn't fly. And it wasn't the flying, it was the being in a tin can with a load of people not able to get off. I think where I was under the lorry for 40 minutes before they got it off me, I think surrounded by people, I think it was probably from that. Um, so I, I had quite a lot of therapy for that with a really good therapist and uh, worked through most of it. Um, and I would advocate therapy for anybody. I think everyone needs it in, for some respect, but it's really important to find the right person. I had, uh, my first therapist was very, very good. And then she was in Salisbury, which was like a 45 minute drive. And I then changed to someone closer and I didn't get on with her very well. But at that point I was pretty much there and I just made me sort myself out. Um, so yeah, it like, if therapy isn't helping, it's probably because it's not the right person helping you. Um, so yeah, so then I felt like I was just getting back on my feet. Oh yeah, so I plateaued and then, sorry, like this is anyone who wants to read the first like bit of, I had quite a lot of, um, I've had quite a lot more done since then, but this was sort of the first month in hospital. Um, and yeah, so I plateaued and but I just, for, for quite a long time, it got me down and then I just worked harder and I've got better and better. And I mean, they said I'd never really run properly again and you'll see later on, I definitely run and I do a lot more. Um, it's just not believing what the doctors tell me. They, told, they said by now I would have needed, I'd have really bad arthritis and would have needed a ankle um, replacement or fusion and I have had neither and I have no pain whatsoever. But again, I've worked really, really hard on that. Um, so yeah, this was the collie part. This was Jinx, my first collie, one of quite a few now. Um, and she was the best therapy at the time. And I would again recommend that to anybody um, because you can't focus on yourself too much. You have to like put a little person before you. Um, so then uh, I did feel like I was getting back on track. And in 2013, uh, it was me and dad on the farm and uh, like a farm, like a farm manager, tractor driver person. Uh, in 2013, my dad was diagnosed with cancer, stage four. Uh, he fought really hard, but yeah, he was, a, he was 73, like the youngest 73 year old still doing everything. And it just, yeah. It, it wiped him out pretty quickly. Um, I, at that point, was with my partner. We got married very quickly so that he'd be there to walk me down the, the um, aisle. So, yeah, um, this was towards the very end. It's the only way you could get around the farm. So I would take him around in a golf buggy. Um, so, yeah, I was promised by the, like, everyone that, the, nothing would change, that the house, farmhouse wouldn't be sold for a couple of years and that Pete, the farm manager, would stay for at least two years. Um, I, at that point, totally confident with sheep, absolutely no problem, but driving tractor, mowing, any of that, fencing, had not a clue. Uh, within three months, the house was sold and Pete had been moved on to another job. So it was just me. Uh, so it was the steepest learning curve. I luckily had a few people around me to help me and show me what to do, but a lot of it was just done me bodging stuff. Um, yeah, just having to figure out how to get on with stuff, having to work out machinery, having to not, well, I did make some mistakes, but um, oh, sorry, this is out of order. This was before my dad died, I took him hunting. Like, he, he went to the end, like two weeks before he died, he was blowing out spraying weeds because that was who he was. Um, 
and yeah and then my first lot of hay making which was an experience because we made little bales um and I don't think I really had time to worry or stress about anything because I just had to get on with it but it was pretty terrifying uh and yeah I'm, I think I'm actually lucky that I didn't make any bigger mistakes than I did um and I still like a couple of months ago I was putting a bale out and was looking at some sheep over the fence and the bale dropped out of the grab and I ended up with a tractor on top of it and I had that moment of like shit I'm on my own that could have been really bad um so yeah I think working you know I work quite a lot of sheep on my own I work every day on my own um I have an amazing team of dogs but it's quite hard not having someone not to bounce off like just I don't even it's not even the input it's just the talking things through with um and yeah it's always just me and the dogs everything I do with me and the dogs I I'm lucky that I have great dogs so that it makes it much easier um but there are two things that I think keep me sane and keep me going. And those are sport and the community that comes with that and social media. There are lots of aspects of social media that I really don't like. Um, but when you find the good side, I think it can be, I think, so when I was growing up on this farm, there were like eight cottages, eight farm cottages, and every single one was occupied by a farm worker. Every morning they'd meet at 7.30, have a chat, they might go off and do their own jobs, come back at 10.30, meet, um, chat, have their break, go off every big event, haymaking, harvest, any big cattle jobs. That was all a big community thing. Uh, and I think that's what farming lacks a lot these days. Like everything's been taken over by machinery. Um, I think I'm rare that I work alone, but I think it's a lot more insular than it used to be. Um, and it's finding that community, however you can find it. And I know that, I know the saying misery love com loves company isn't, like it's not great, like, it's not very positive, but there is something in that, that when you're having a tough time to know that other people are going through it too, there is a bit of solace you can find in that. Um, and also chatting to people about how they're going, what they're going to do, how they're going to deal with the issues. Um, you know, at the moment I have a, I mean, it's, it's like barren here. There is no grass and it's trying to work out what the best thing to do is for the rest of the season and going into topping um, and knowing a few people in the same situation, being able to chat about it and work out what they're doing, what the best options are, just helps, I think, the thought process and makes you feel less alone. So I have made some amazing friends through social media. Some I've never met, but are great pals. A few that I see on a fairly regular basis and um, who've become really, really close friends that I'm eternally grateful for. Um, and I think, yeah, I think sometimes it can be a bit toxic social media. I used to do a lot on Twitter, but I've come away from that. There was a lot of vegans, um, and although I've learned to just block and delete them, it, it can sometimes get on top of you. And there's a, far, a few farming forums that I found a little bit, they got a bit political. But for me, Instagram is the one where I've made, met a lot of really good people, um, had some good opportunities come like this. Um, and I think it's quite a healthy community and quite a forward thinking community of people, farmers. Um, the problem is you start to think that everyone is quite progressive and forward thinking and then realise that maybe not. Um, but yeah, that for me has been a real uh, help in my struggling times because I know that always, uh, like for instance, lambing, like the first week this, this year was amazing. Weather was incredible. Ewes were just popping out lambs. I lamb outside. 
and it was great. And then about 10 days in, started to get a bit tired, thinking it's going too well, something's gonna happen. And uh, I was tired and then I had a problem after a problem after a problem. And like individually, none of those problems were big uh, or much I could do about it. There was a, a ewe that I think the lamb had ruptured her. When she lamb, she lamb naturally, she had twins. She was fine, they were up and sucked the following morning. She literally, she didn't look very good. I stood her up, she walked off about 20 meters, collapsed and died. Um, and then a ewe had had a really nice twin, but one still born. Uh, I think I had a fox took a couple of lambs that turned into a bigger problem, but they all like added up. And I suddenly was like, I hate this. This is too hard. It's all going wrong. And I literally had to stop myself and go, it's really not like you're tired. You get this little black period in lambing every year and you'll get through it and just go and look at the good ones, go and look at the live ones, focus on those. Um, but it's easy to get like overwhelmed and feel like the problems are bigger than they are when you're in the midst of it and you're tired and you're doing your best and you can't be everywhere all the time and you, you can't save every single one but um, you just have to remember that like nature is pretty brutal uh, and you can't save them all you can only do your best and that you know uh, but you know, I, I think I, from experience of like many lambings under my belt, knowing that I will get through it and that it will be okay, and that I'll come out the other side. It's just about 24, 48 hours, and it's that if those 24 hours have been at the beginning of lambing, you kind of accept it more because it's like black fortnight, and you expect the problems at the beginning. But when you're in the middle and you're shattered, it um, feels worse than it is. And I come out the other side, and I'm like, actually, it wasn't that bad. Why was I? so upset about it so I have to like I remind myself when I'm in it that I know that I'll come out the other side and it I'll be like actually it was okay um so the other my other avenue is uh fitness I've always been quite active uh when I worked in London military fitness training in parks I ran a lot but I found four or five years ago I found um like strength and conditioning, so weights basically. And that was actually pivotal for me, for my, uh, my mental health. Um, I, after my accident, I was very scarred. Uh, and you can't really see it there, but I am, I've got scars on every limb. Um, and it really changed my relationship with my body and my confidence and I felt like a very different person to who I was before my accident. I always like saw me as me before and me after as two quite separate people. Um, and I started lifting weights and got stronger and stronger and it really changed my relationship with my body. I stopped seeing it as a sort of aesthetic thing and I started really appreciating what it could do and especially what it could do considering what it had been through. And it just gave me a huge amount of confidence. Um, I, at the time, was also going through a divorce, which was my choice. And the, like, the community that I found at the gym, it's a very small gym with a group we always trained together. Uh, and the confidence I found in myself helped me get through that. Um, it genuinely changed my life. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of comps, um, team stuff, always team stuff. On my own. Um, and I've had the most amazing experiences and made amazing friends and I train probably six days a week and it gives me an hour off farm not talking about farming not thinking about farming all I think about is not dying um, and it just so healthy and talking to people you know often actually people are really interested and ask me questions because I see stuff on Instagram, but just talking about anything else, taking your brain away from it, it's like a just a break. Um, and I don't think, like, I'm not saying sports for everyone, but something away from farming, I think, is really important. There seems to be this badge of honor within agriculture that the longer hours you work, the less holiday you take, the, the, the less you leave the farm 
the better it is like the better farmer you are the more like invested you are but actually you like it's so unhealthy and that i think it's a big reason why we have huge mental health issues within farming because of this badge of honor and you feel like guilty sometimes i do it you feel guilty for taking a holiday or leaving the farm like god i can't but we all really need to because otherwise we just burn out um and i think you need it for your relationships with your with all your family you know partners children parents everyone like everyone needs space everyone needs time out and if you even if you can't bring yourself to take like a week away an hour a few times a week just having a mental break from everything i think is really healthy and i think it is what has like keeps me sane um and I do feel it sometimes I get too busy to go to the gym and I'm like, I have to make time to go to the gym today because I'm actually going to employ a little bit. Um, so, yeah. So, and it also has given me a huge amount of resilience, uh, being able to push myself through really hard workouts uh, and compete. Um, and the other side effect is I can now pick up a U, no problem chucker in the back of the pickup um, without hurting my back or pulling something i don't have to fight them when i handle them it makes my job so much easier because you're only ever as strong as you need to be if you don't train outside of a job like if you don't do extra you're as strong as you need to be to get the job done but you're never any stronger and you're not more stable and i the difference now in how easy jobs are that i'm much stronger is incredible and it just everything's quicker um you know if i'm driving around and i see a problem i can just catch her stick her in the back of the pickup bring her in or treat her and i don't have to go home and get the trailer um yeah it's just much much easier so i also have a slight problem in that i'm unable to say no to challenges uh Cycling obviously was uh, not the easiest thing to get back to, but after my accident, I, within six months, got back on a bike, a mountain bike, around a field on a farm, but I was determined. And uh, eventually I, within a year, I think I got back on a bike on the road, but was really anxious, but I did it. And then I was like, I've done it, that's enough. Uh, but about four years ago, some friends started triathlon training and um, I started training with them. And they were amazing at looking after me and they would like, someone was cycling in front, someone was cycling behind and uh, were very patient with me and I slowly built confidence. Um, then I did a few triathlons myself and I loved the cycling. I actually like rediscovered my love, loved it more than I did when I was commuting by bike. Um, and someone came up with, at the beginning of the year, the idea of cycling from Sandbanks to saint -Tropez. And without thinking, I said, yes. Uh, this is my problem. I say yes, and then I think about it, and then I'm like, oh my god, I can't do it. Oh my god, it's too much, too much. Same thing happened this one. <laughs> yes, and then I was like, oh god, no. Um, but I trained really hard. I trained through lambing, which is part of the reason why I was so tired, um, because I didn't want to fail this, and I was also the only female, and I didn't want to let our side down. I didn't want to be the one that held up the the, the group uh, there were 10 of us doing it um but i did it i loved it one day was pretty hard cycling past leon because it was all on very busy roads and i still get quite hyper aware hyper vigilant and it's exhausting i, I just don't trust any car um but because i put in the fitness training i got through it fine and then i felt great afterwards and actually it's really my cycling has massively improved from that um yes yeah, so, uh but also the night before i left for that bike ride at about eight o'clock my absolute heart dog i actually can't look at this picture uh i could have to take off um she died suddenly um and we were leaving at seven o'clock the following morning and yeah just to add to the difficulty of what was lying ahead the challenge i had to deal with that losing her uh i don't think i'll ever get over losing her she was my like absolute soulmate of a dog um 
I cried a lot, cried the whole ferry journey, cried probably for the first two days of cycling. Um, but I got through it. I did, coming home was pretty hard, but I just pictured her running along with me um, the whole way, a little bit like water shit down, I had bright eyes in my, <laughs> in my uh, head. Uh, so yeah, so like there's always seems to be challenges on top of challenges. Uh, but, you know, I knew that I'd lost my dad and I got through that, so I went through losing her. Um, fresh back from doing the cycling challenge, Sam in the middle of this picture messaged me and said, you up your next challenge again? I said, yes, I was knowing what it was, uh, cause I cannot say no. And um, we, a few weeks ago, we did a Guinness World Records 24 hour max sled push it wasn't pushing like 24 hours we did two hours on four hours off uh in teams of four but uh i knew a couple of these guys um mostly they're all pretty much former marines one serving marine and then three other formidable women um who will have amazing stories uh and surrounding yourself with people that are just incredible and have off the charts resilience and strength and mental strength is so inspiring. Um, it was an incredible 24 hours of everyone pushing themselves. I mean, one of the guys found out afterwards that he'd ruptured his bicep and has just had surgery on it and he did the whole thing with the ruptured bicep. So yeah, it, and that community you get in that team spirit, um, it was pretty immense and also so this is Ziggy. She was given to me uh, last year. She's just over a year old and I wasn't looking for her. It was just an amazing gift from a friend I met through social media, through Twitter actually. Um, and uh, she has started to fill the hole that the ghost left. Um, and I don't think everything happens for a reason. I think you find the best out of bad situations. But I feel like she's come at the right time. Um, I, don't, I think of all the tough things I've been through, everything that life has thrown at me, I really good has come from all of it. I wouldn't take back my accident for a minute. I've learned so much. I've had amazing opportunities from it. Um, I know myself so much better for it. I'm stronger for it. I've never been physically or mentally stronger. Obviously, I would kind of think to have my dad back, but I've learned so much through that. Uh, it taught me I had so many lessons through, through losing him. Um, I mean, I could talk about the farm here, the situation here. It's not, it's just me farming. It's family owned. Uh, that comes with a lot of issues and problems. Um, there's a dog park next door that they've built, which gives me a lot of trouble with dog worrying. Uh, but I'm, the next challenge is moving farms. So that's gonna be a huge one. I'm in the process, I found somewhere, but it's a big old project. So um, yeah, and the other reason I can do this on my own is because of my team of dogs. They are uh, everything to me, my dogs. I could not do it without them. Um, I put a lot of time into them, but they give a huge amount back and they're all worth, well, mostly worth their weight in gold. Sometimes they're annoying. Um, people ask how I managed to take the time away to go to the gym and that is because I've Partly because I have the great team of dogs that make jobs quicker and easier, but I have worked really, really hard to, I record everything, uh, some things better than others, but I've worked really hard to build a flock of views that work for me, um, that I have to touch as little as possible, um, that work on this ground. And interestingly, I have brought in Odd use here and there, and none of them perform like my homebreds. They just don't seem to cope. I do them quite hard. They have to do just grass, 
um, or forage fed. I don't feed concentrates occasionally. I'll give them some blocks if desperate. Um, I expect them to work for me and I select hard for that. And I brought, I brought in some Hebrideans thinking oh, they'll live on thin air. They'll be great. If my ewes can do, they'll be fat as houses. Uh, no, they've been terrible because they've come from a Devon farm where they've been looked after really, really well and molly coddled and they've come here and they're like, yeah, no, can't cope. And that's what I do, I think. Um, they were for dog training and I thought I'd lamb them because they'd be great, but they, you know, they've been trouble. I had, I had some Highlanders here from the Perbex, so they should have been on quite, they should be quite roughy tufty. And in payment, I had 400 here on TAC and in payment, I had some ewes and none of them have performed like my homebreds. Um, so I am learning not to buy anything in. Uh, I lamb outside. If I don't touch them, that's best. Um, so yeah, I've worked really hard to produce a ewe that is just easy care, but with wool. That might come next. I haven't decided yet, the shedding thing. I can't, I, I'm not sure about it. Um, I'm still working on feet. That would be my biggest problem, my highest work burden. Uh, I've sort of nearly eradicated foot rot just through culling, but God reared its head through the tack sheep. So, um, yeah, so I like to drive around and see this and keep driving. And then I record them at 24 hours. Um, yeah, and, and record any problems and just keep from the best use. And yeah, I thought I'd finish on just a picture of a sheep <laughs> in my house. Uh, she was a pet lamb, Delilah. She's a little bit famous on Twitter actually more than anything. And she grew up in the house because she was out of the twin out of a lamb late. The bigger pet lambs believed her and she ended up in the house, grew up with the dogs got mastitis, I brought her home to the garden to look after her. She went straight in and lay where she used to lay as a little lamb. So yeah, that's Delilah. So yeah, that's my story. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free. Thank you very much, uh, Gemma. It's, uh, yeah, thank you for, for that uh, powerful uh, story. Um, just in the interest of time, I, I'm going to. Um, no, no, it's it's no, no, it's absolutely okay. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask if you could stop sharing your screen, and we will pass straight over to Chris. Um, and yes, if you do have a question, um, we will have a a chance. You will have a chance at the end to ask, uh, but you can also type questions into the the Q and A box uh, as well. So yeah, uh, without any further ado, Chris, if you could unmute and uh, and yeah, I'll let you take it on, take it away. Thanks, Carl, and thanks, Gemma. I know a lot of the things I'm using to speak about, and I think it just highlights, you know, oh, obviously, you know, a lot of traumatic experiences, but life does throw curveballs at everybody, and we don't know what's kind of around the corner and and how we deal with that and how we bounce back from it. And it's not always easy. But I think as Jim has shown that it uh, is doable and some people need a wee bit more support than others. Um, and there's no shame in that either. And that's what RACBI tries to do is we support um, people in Scottish agriculture. And um, we've been around for 125 years. It's our 125th anniversary um, this year. Um, I manage the welfare team. Um, so I manage a, a, a group of case officers dotted about the country. Um, who provide support to you know people who are involved in Scottish agriculture, so crofters, farmers, farm workers, industries related to agriculture, depend and dependence of of those people as well, um, and not necessarily people who are engaged in agriculture just now, but who have um, since retired as well. Um, so just to give you a bit of background to people who may not be aware of us in. Um, we obviously support people in Scottish agriculture, being Scottish based, and um, we provide three strands of support to people. Um, we feel that you know taking that holistic approach and and looking at you know a number of areas um, that we can provide support, we really gets people to move forward. 
Um, we so we provide emotional, practical, and financial support. Um, and we find that, as I say, the three strands of support really kind of come into their own um, when we're trying to get people to get into a better place. And, you know, the emotional side of things, that invo involves a lot of time um, talking to people on the phone, over text, face-to-face, -face, any means really necessary, um, and just listening and giving them the space to, to talk. It's not always easy to find somebody to speak to, especially as Gemma had mentioned, you know, working alone, not having them to, to bounce ideas off of. Um, so we're at the other end of the phone, we might know, know all the answers, um, but we'll certainly talk things through and hopefully, you know, point people in the right direction. Um, so we we are a very small, a uh, fairly small team. Um, there's about twelve of us in total, about five or six in the welfare team. Um, but we do quite a lot to cover the the, the length and breadth of Scotland. Um, and as I say, case officers they are our main point of contact for our clients. Um, we're a mixture of people who are involved in agriculture, have a background, and those who don't. Um, so the, the people who don't can sometimes bring, bring a wee bit many a, a fresh perspective to things with other skills and, and areas of expertise as well. And we find that that mix um, really works well to try and um, solve problems for people. Um, but we've all got the same kind of goal, and that's to try and get the best support to people who are involved in Scottish agriculture. And, you know, I know the, the theme of this webinar is about mental health and resilience, and it's something that we, do, we, we help people, we talk to people about on a daily basis. Um, and I think it just speaks volumes of the pressures of working in agriculture and the, the stress that people are under, especially at the moment, uh, cost of living, fuel prices, fertilizer prices, concerns about the winter and moving forward in terms of feeding, things like that. Um, there's a lot to, to, to think about when you're working in agriculture and especially you know, there's a trend that people are working alone. Um, so we're always worried about, you know, how people respond to, to pressures. And we we feel that having that practical and financial element of support as well um, takes that holistic approach. So although people may be struggling with their mental health, we try and look at root causes of problems as well. So if it's issues with the business, for instance, that's really having an impact on someone, then um, we would help them to look at the business side of things and, and try and put them in touch with people who can who can really have a, a good look at things and make recommendations. So that's just one of the ways in which we help. One, one of the big ways in which we help, as I said, is listening to people and it's giving them that opportunity to call us and have a blather. They don't need to have a reason to phone us. It's just having a chat with somebody, you know, there's this, you know, in agriculture just now, it's common for a lot of people, the majority of people to be working themselves or they've, they've maybe got a family, but they don't want to kind of tell all their worries to their family because they don't want their, their family to worry about things. Um, so it's that confidential space where people can, can speak to somebody who knows what it's like to work in agriculture, know what it's like to be involved in farming and crofting, um, knows the pressures, knows the struggles, completely impartial, completely um, non-judgmental, um, and just giving people really a, a space to, to talk and we will listen. And that doesn't matter how long somebody's on the phone, we've not got, we don't need somebody 10 minutes just to have a chat and then we hang up the phone. You know, people can speak to, to us as long as they want. And we've recently just um, went 24 seven. And um, so matter, no matter the time of day, um, people can lift up the phone and speak to us. Um, and now people can get in touch maybe through web chat if they like as well. Um, so we've just launched that recently. So we're trying to give people as many avenues as possible to get in touch with. Um, a lot of your times is supporting people through difficult periods of uh, their, their life. Um, and that could be through poor mental health, exacerbated by a bereavement, exacerbated by audits that they're going through, the pressures of that. Um, animal welfare issues, which we tend to find there's always a, a human welfare issue behind an animal welfare issue as well. So we want to try and focus on the human aspect to that. Um, and that could involve making links with other organisations that are involved in say an audit or an animal welfare issue. It could 
attending, you know, going out and, and on a farm visit uh, with somebody and being there as they're maybe going through a, an inspection or something like that, just as that kind of moral support. Um, so that's one of the ways in, in which we help, and it is very, very beneficial, not just for the person that's involved, but also um, the the organisations that are involved as well, because we can usually help with the communication. Um, and we work, we, we don't have expertise in everything, um, so we work with a lot of specialists, and we work closely with Farm Advisory Service um, in terms of, you know, consult, farm consultants and, and things like that as well, and people like that. Um, to try and get um, business reviews done for people and look at how the business is and look at ways forward and recommendations to, to do things a bit differently to try and support them. Um, and we look at the financial aspect as well. So something that's particularly important at the moment is um, our help for heating grant. Um, so people who have maybe got concerns and, and stresses over heating their, their, their homes and things, um, we can provide a help for heating grant. And just, you know, something to mention, given the, the topic of the webinar, um, is our counselling support as well. So um, we have a grant that's available to people to access um, counselling free of charge. Um, so that means that people can skip NHS services and they can get access to, to a, a private um, counsellor. Um, and we try and link up with councillors who have an agricultural background just to make it easier for people to speak to them. Um, they've already got an understanding um, of what it's like to work in farming or crofting. Um, and that's something that I would recommend, as, as Gemma said as well, you know, at some point in our lives, we all go through peaks and troughs of, of mental, we have good mental health and we have bad mental health. And when we're going through a bad spell, then you maybe need to see a professional and that's the exact same way, you know, you've got a, an issue with your, your back or something like that, you go and see the doctor and um, there shouldn't be any difference. Um, but we all know that there's still a stigma. Um, with mental health and that might be a wee bit more pronounced in rural areas um, but you know I do think that over the last couple of years there's been a lot of work done there's been a lot of great campaigns that have been out that has really helped with trying to reduce that stigma and encourage people to, to talk about their mental health um, and you know having Gemma speaking this evening as well only helps that as well because it just highlights that it doesn't matter who you are, what you do. We're all at some point, as I say, we'll go through a period of poor mental health and it is nothing to be ashamed of at all. So needing the help of a professional, um, I would definitely encourage it. So if there's MD out there at the moment listening or if there's MD who knows somebody who may benefit from it, um, to please get in touch and see how we can, we can help them. Um, and I've just put that up there um, just to try and emphasise, not to say that we all be fantastic or whatever, um, but it's really just to try and emphasise that a lot of people that we speak to say that they wish that they picked the phone up quicker. Um, and I know it's easy to look back and say that, but picking up the phone when you know you feel that you need to early intervention for us is really important. And um, so, yeah, the amount of people who and it is difficult to pick up the phone to a stranger and tell them your woes and how your how things are and really bear your soul to them. Um, but as I said earlier on, it's we approach things with a non-judgmental view. We listen and we're there to listen. So um, again, if you, if anybody knows anybody or somebody that's listening just now, please pick up the phone or get in touch in any way. Um, and you'll be met with somebody who will listen, who will, no matter what you say, or non-judgmental. Um, can, can I just say that I actually think that talking to someone that isn't at all involved can sometimes be easier because they are not mm -hmm. emotional about it. They don't, it doesn't affect them. Yep. I don't mean that in a negative way. But it's, it doesn't, you're not going to upset them. You're not going to hurt them. You're not going to disappoint them. They have no judgment whatsoever. Yeah. They're just there to help you. So sometimes talking to someone completely like who's not at all involved is easier and um, 
you, it's kind of you can open up a little bit and yep. you know it's not going any further you know it stays within those four walls or on the phone or whatever um mm -hmm. and just add not only did I have therapy after my uh accident I also had a life coach last year because I knew I had some stuff I needed to deal with in process that I just patterns that I've had all my life that weren't really not helpful for me um and making me unhappy so like it wasn't just an accident I like I think it's an ongoing thing and it's something you have to work on all the time like it's not like oh I fixed myself I'm good no. like it is it takes work mm -hmm. like and it has to come from you as well so, yeah, yeah so I'll meet myself now <laughs> <laughs> no but you, Jim is completely right it's speaking to somebody that's completely removed from the situation there's no that baggage um, you know, speaking to a, a wife or a parent, husband, sister, or brother, there's that there's a baggage there. You might not open up completely. Um, you're a wee bit worried about what somebody might think. Um, but yeah, speaking to somebody that is completely removed, it can you know people will just sometimes pick up the phone to us. They won't say hello. They'll just go into what they're wanting to talk about because it's been built up and built up and built up and knew that they've got that space to to kind of really talk and they know that you know it won't go anywhere it's completely confidential um, and that is so important especially in rural communities that we emphasize that as well that it is entirely confidential and it won't go anywhere else um, so yeah I'll kind of wrap up there and say that's our helpline number and um, so it's free phone now um, 24 hours seven days a week um, we've just recently launched um, web chat as well. So that's another way that people can get in touch with us. Um, and yeah, or you can email us as well. So I've no kind of went into a lot of stuff that we support with. There's a lot there that we can help with. Um, just our, our, our counselling grant for this topic of the webinar, I thought was definitely worth mentioning and making people aware of just in case they themselves need it or somebody that they know might need it. Um, so yeah, please then um, pick up the phone or, or get in touch another way.